Good morning and welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And if you have sensitive ears in the room, a little one, uh, it's probably a good idea to bring them to the kids' area if you haven't done that already. I don't see any, but just in case, because we're going to go from like kindergarten lessons straight to full-on AA. That's what we're... <laughs> so some, some sensitive topics here. So here's the thing. I heard a story about a rabbit. See, it starts off like real innocent, and so it doesn't stay that way. <laughs> about a rabbit. The rabbit liked to run around... The forest, or jungle, I think is better for this story. We're going to use jungle, so don't get all technical on me. It's just a story. Remain calm. So the rabbit, rabbit, he runs around in the morning, every morning, runs around the jungle, runs around the jungle. Well, one day, he starts thinking, I know everything. Right? I know everything. What I'm doing is right for everybody. So he decides that everybody needs to be like him. So it's early in the morning. The rabbit gets up. He's running, 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 running. He goes to Monkey's house. Bum, 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 bum. Monkey, get up. Come run with me. If you want to be healthy like me, you've got to go running in the morning. The monkey's like, it's 5 a.m., rabbit. Go away. Ah, that's too bad, monkey. You'll never be healthy like me. So he's run, 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 run. Goes to Wolf's house. Bang, 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 bang. 5 a.m. What's going on? Come on, Wolf. Run with me. If you're going to be healthy like me, you have to run. Go away, rabbit. You're crazy, right? Run, 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 run. Gets to Parrot's house. Bang, 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 bang. Parrot, wake up. You got to come run with me. Parrot's like, no, because parrots don't run. So anyway, <laughs> moving on. We're going to go. All right. So run, 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 run. Fox's house. Bang, bang, bang. Fox, get up. If you want to be healthy like me, you have to run with me. Fox is like, no, it's 5 a.m. You'll never be like me, Fox. Too bad. Run, 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 run. Bang, 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 bang. Lion's house. <laughs> lion gets up. Right, so you got to be healthy like me, lion. Come on, be like me. Lion opens up the door and swipes him with his giant paw, killing the rabbit. The other animals see it. What did you do? He just wanted us all to be healthy, like him. Healthy, says the lion. Healthy? That crazy rabbit stays up all night partying and doing drugs. And when they wear off, he gets up, he's up in the morning and he does more, gets all hopped up and runs around the jungle trying to tell us to be healthy. Told you. <laughs> yup. So, indeed. Proverbs 27, 14. A loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. There's a lesson for you. Rabbit could get you killed, too. So <laughs> I told you, we'd go from kindergarten to straight AA this morning. Welcome to Real Church for Real People. And indeed, we're going to talk about humility today. We could say that the rabbit like <laughs> humility, maybe a little bit of hypocrisy. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I've told you the Bible is not in chronological order. We've talked about that in the past. You can always go back and watch previous messages. So I make these charts for you guys. Some people say they're helpful. So today it's actually a little bit easier, but I'm just going to stay in keeping with the chart so you can see how we're going along. Sometimes you kind of got to mix and match. You got to put Matthew over here. It's all over the place. Today, it's a straight line. These are all things that are pretty much not in the other gospel accounts. So we're just going to go straight through today. That's rare, right? So a few chapters. We're going to continue in John 1. We're going to see Jesus' first disciples. We're going to get what I call like the handoff there. It's kind of important to our theme. It's going to end cap. The wedding at Cana, some of you are familiar with this. And no, no, it's not okay to get drunk on the wine. That's not the point because I hear that all the time in church, right? So someone will come in all like, you know, Jesus' miracle was turning water into wine. I'm like, right, <laughs> but not getting drunk. So <laughs> don't have that takeaway. Jesus clears the temple. We're going to talk about that too. We get some bad teachings that come out of that one. Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, the born-again conversation, we've talked about that, so we're going to go through that real quick. And then John exalts Jesus. We're going to see an end cap of humility here in John the Baptist. So, let's hop right in. John 135. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples as Jesus walked by. John looked at him and declared, look, 
There is the Lamb of God. Now, he's doing it again. So it starts off the following day. So remember last week, he was doing the same type of thing. Look, there is the Lamb of God. So it's pointing to Jesus. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John. But you will be called Cephas or Cephas, which means Peter. So there is that handoff that we talked about last week. So what was the point, right? John's job, the Messiah's herald. My job, point to Jesus, get out of the way. That's the point, right? So you do not want to follow me. You need to follow Jesus, right? So I'm just that, just the herald pointing the way. It's not about me. Get out of the way. John 1.43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity, <laughs> in whom there is no deceit, it kind of says literally. How do you know about me? <laughs> Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will see all heaven open and angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. So if you know the word really well, he's drawing from Jacob there. But here in this account, you're seeing, it kind of plays with Nathaniel a little bit here. It's kind of funny, right? And so, you know, he blows his mind a little bit. Really? Ah, there's a man of complete integrity. And so what you have going on here is probably a couple things. Do you remember Micah 5 too? We talked about that. The Messiah, where he's supposed to be born, Bethlehem. But everyone's saying he's from Nazareth, not where he was born, just where he grew up. He's like, can anything good come from Nazareth? Also, rival towns probably, right? So Jesus zings him. <laughs> he's like, ah, there's a man with complete integrity. He doesn't lie. Like, huh? And kind of blows his mind. But you also, if you catch it there, you'll also see that Nathaniel's not <laughs> so humble. There's a man of complete integrity. How'd you know about me? Right? You know, so <laughs> when you look about it that way, it's funny. We see that God has a sense of humor. So humility. Now, the wedding at Cana. We're just, I'm going to read it right to you. John 2, 1. We turn the page. The next day, see it keeps moving along here, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. So this is an emergency, right? So if we have a wine emergency, Jesus says, dear woman or woman, that's not our problem. He's not being rude there. That's probably why they put dear there. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. That's a lot of wine, right? So Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. Almost always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. So, there are a few things going on here. 
uh, you see the humility of Jesus. He could do whatever he wants, right? So he could have been going off and just making miracles all like crazy, but no, he needs to do it according to the Father's plan. So this is the initial hesitation. When he sets certain things in motion, we're going to go. He has to fill this, fulfill the scriptures. But eh, this isn't going to mess things up too much according to the Father's plan. So, okay, I'll do it. So here you see the obedience to his mother. You see the humility of Jesus all in one thing right here. Not to miss that. Jesus clears the temple. We'll put the chart back up. This is where this is. Uh, this gets kind of confusing because it happens twice. It happens in the beginning uh, of John and then in the end of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Most scholars say that it happens twice. So he does it two times. He does it at the beginning of his ministry and then he does it toward the end, right? Initiates that, that passion week. So that's probably what's going on here. So we're going to do this later, and I'm going to group those two together. There's a little bit of a difference here where he makes a whip, and he chases everybody out of the temple. So here's the thing. I have to say this, unfortunately. <laughs> Please do not use this account as an excuse to be all angry and violent. <laughs> I've addressed that in this series already. When someone does that, I'm like, Ugh. like, you do not know the word at all if you're going to use this account, all right? You are not Jesus. That's the first problem. And someone using it? Uh, it probably thinks they're God. That's why they're using it, right? You're not. You're not God. You're not fulfilling Scripture. And no, you need to keep reading, right? So Paul, Ephesians 4, 26, right? So yeah, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? So we don't want to give a place, it says in Greek, for the devil. Verse 27, don't give a place for the devil. Sounds like he's quoting Psalm 4, 4. <laughs> it says that too, uh -uh, don't sin and be angry. What? We looked at the, the fleshly sins and the fruit of the Spirit. What was in that bad sinful category? Outbursts of anger. Bad. Paul is clarifying for you. James 1.20, right? <laughs> the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. No. Okay? So, yes, it's a sin. Just as a note there. We're continuing. Jesus and Nicodemus. We did that. We talked about the born-again conversation. He's this religious uh, leader there, teacher. You should know the concept of being born again. Jesus explains it to him. We're going to go over that because we did it already, and then we continue in John 3, 22. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the Judean countryside. He spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Enon near Salem because there was plenty of water there, and people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I'm filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts this testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's word, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The Father loves His Son and has put everything into His hands. And everyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. So wrap your minds around this. John's got a real big ministry. So we know, like, historians talk about it. Real big. This ministry is huge. And his disciples are like, yo, everyone's going to Him instead of us. This is a problem for them. Right? I'm just here to pray away for him. Good is the response. Good. He must become greater and greater. He must increase and I must decrease. Again, we see here that John exalts Jesus. He's just there to prepare the way for him. That's it. 
And here's the thing. We saw that John was also warning people to prepare their hearts for Jesus. That was a big thing we looked at. And we're going to see that a prepared heart is a humble heart. Very important. We must follow John's example here. You see, he knows he's not the Savior. Last week, we talked about some people having a Savior complex. It's a big problem we have in that country, right? The army of one. Like, that's what all the movies are about, everything, right? So, you know, against these insurmountable odds, like, you know, I, it's just going to be me, right? I'm going to take out, like, a whole country's army, you know, Rambo syndrome. But that's people. We get this in our head, our country, our culture tells us to believe that, tells us to be like that. So we get a savior complex, and we're always inserting ourselves in the story like that, right? We're going to solve the problem. But what do the scriptures tell us? Get out of the way. Point the way and let Jesus do his thing. He's the solution. He's the Savior. That's what a good herald for Jesus does. And sometimes, we talked about this, so I'll mention it briefly, we become the go-to. We become the go-to. Right? It's pride. People are going to him instead. What are we going to do? Good. Good. That's our job. We see here that a humble servant <clears throat> is always just preparing the way. We see how John dressed, right? We have, he looks like Elijah, right? But, you know, he's eating wild locusts and honey. While he's living in the wilderness, he's of humble means. Also, what does he say to Jesus? Remember last week? I need to be baptized by you. He tells everybody, I'm not even worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. I'm not even going to start. I get to washing his feet, right? Take the sandal off. We're not, we haven't gotten to washing the feet yet. Not even worthy. It's untied the strap of his sandal. We see this theme of humility woven throughout this section of Scripture. Whether it be Nathaniel's lack thereof, Jesus' humility and obedience, or, of course, John here. We get a picture of a humble herald in John. Humility. <laughs> Let's look at what humility means. Ready? The dictionary says, Humility, and this is just one of them, a modest or low view of one's own importance, freedom from pride or arrogance. Huh. Biblical example, Galatians 6.2. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> so <laughs> this is... Mulling this over, I was like, wow, this is like, just, just think about this. This is the opposite of what we're told in our culture, right? Think about it. Like, this is crazy town right here. This is like, what are you saying? Like, you know, what? Wait, a modest? So you, we don't hear that, do we? You're supposed to have a modest or low view of yourself. Really? Okay. Freedom from pride or arrogance. Well, arrogance, yeah, it's kind of a bad word, but pride. On both sides of the political aisle. Puffed up with pride. They say it's a good thing. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says pride is a sin. Ooh, that's another word we're not allowed to use anymore, are we? Mm. Pride's not a good thing. You're not that important. What? I am Rambo. What do you mean I'm not that important? I'm going to talk about humility today. Humility is also about considering your own faults and extending that grace to others. Ephesians 4.2. Always be humble and gentle. When? Always. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Be patient. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humility is also about Yielding to others. <laughs> have you ever been, everybody's done it, I've done it. Have you ever, like, tried to be first in line? Like, without making it obvious that you're trying to be first in line, <laughs> right? 
Or have you just not cared? I see that a lot. Like, we go to Disney World a lot, and that's crazy. Like, people just, I've just now, like, started, Jesus has said, calm down, right? So, because people will just blatantly cut in line. You're like, there are people here. I can see you, right? And they ignore you. They're just like, I can see you. And they got the kids trained. They all do the same thing, like, but we can see you. You just cut ahead in line, right? You know, so now I'm just like, Whatever, just read my Bible, read my Bible, right? So anyway, have you ever tried to, like, cut someone off in traffic? Had to be first, right? Cut them off in traffic. And again, we can see you, but, you know, the window's rolled up, the music, you got the window tint. Anyway, so if we (laughs) go to Luke, Jesus talks about this, not literally at Disney or in a car, but it's similar. Luke 14, 7, when Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. Jesus is like the guest you don't want there, right? So you're doing something wrong. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? Imagine saying that. (laughs) Someone sits in your seat, and this is what comes out of your mouth. Crazy. The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you'll be embarrassed, and you'll have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then, when your host sees you, he will come and say, Friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who push for position will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus may have this in mind. Proverbs 25, 6. Don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head of the table than to be sent away in public disgrace. So if you're new, like Jesus is New Testament, this is Old Testament. He kind of probably has that in mind. He wrote it, right? So <laughs> this is going to be good. So... <clears throat> I'm getting a lot of emails this afternoon. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> Humility is also about not thinking you know everything. What? What? I know everything. <laughs> Romans 12, 3. Paul's writing here. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. If we jump ahead, Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. What version is that, Pastor Gene? (laughs) That's what it says, right? So that's what it means. Don't think you know it all. And here's another one along those lines. We'll go back to the Proverbs. (laughs) If not for others, then maybe for yourself. Some practical advice here. Proverbs 25.8. No, actually, it's 7b. Just because you've seen something, don't be in a hurry to go to court. For what will you do in the end if your neighbor deals you a shameful defeat? Here, look, we'll pair this with this so you understand it. Proverbs 18.17. The first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. Ever have that happen to you? Run right into a brick wall. Doesn't feel good, especially like after like uh, depositions and things like that. So not highly recommended. (laughs) All right, so what we're going to do, you guys are quiet. It's making me a little nervous, but I'll be all right. So (laughs) so we're going to give you guys, we're going to have some fun with some of them, and then some of them are going to be like, I hate you. So we're going to do some humility exercises. These are some things that we can do in our everyday lives. I've tried all of them out, so they're safe. It's not going to get you killed. So you can try them all out on your own. Ready? So we're going to start. You guys aren't going to like somebody. So here's the thing. (laughs) Deliberately, here's what I want you to try. Deliberately get behind someone going too slow and stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, so think about that for a second. It's just say, like, some prayers. Wherever I'm going is not really important enough, right, to be completely rude, right? And especially if you have the Jesus fish on the back of your car. The answer is not taking it off. Just be a better person, right? So <laughs> anyway, so try that. Just stay right there, 
Now, we talked about the savior complex, right? And so look, look, if it's an emergency, it, it's never an emergency, but if it's an emergency, that's what the left lane is for. We talked about lane usage, right? So left lane, don't police that, but you can pass in that one, the middle one's for traveling, and the slow one's over here. So if you're going to be a slowpoke, get over there. But anyway, stay in that one and do that. And yes, I've, I've been told you can get a ticket for being in the fast lane too long. It's a thing. So anyway, ask Deputy Johnson after the service. He'll verify that piece of information. But he doesn't want to go there too much because he knows that my wife, and you'll see she can get angry, um, and you know, she does that, and then Tony doesn't want to get choked out. So anyway, <laughs> you'll see. Okay. <laughs> so... You know, that's the thing. You, you, I don't know, maybe you're late for work, but that's your fault, right? So spend some time in that lane and think about it. Think about what you did, right? So, <laughs> and don't do your makeup and all the other stuff because that's really obnoxious. Along the same <laughs> line of thinking, let someone ahead of you in line. Try that out, right? Your lane barrier, right? So you're in the grocery store or something like that. I'm not allowed there. That's a whole other story. So <clears throat> you get the lane. This is my Space, do not cross, right? So you put that there. You know, someone comes along, maybe if they have a lot of things even, maybe they have somewhere to go, the kid's crying, it's all crazy, so just, you know, remove your barrier. You know, be like, come on, and I'll pay for your groceries. <laughs> but that's what Jesus said to do. Not literally, but kind of. So anyway, try that. Let someone ahead of you yield to someone. Be nice. Okay, here's a good one. This is kind of funny. So I'd like throw a funny one in so that you guys would remain calm. So <clears throat> here's, this is really good. Parents will get this. Be solely responsible for a two-year-old for 24 hours. Give that one a try. All right, so that can be a really humiliating experience. Now, I can say that I've done this for uh, 24 hours because we co-parented, but there was a time, and this will come up again, like I was kind of working for myself, so I ran the online business during the day, and at night I would teach people jujitsu. That's what I did. So I could watch the baby during the day, and yes, yeah, so it was really humiliating. Like, for example, I've told you this before, so I'll make it really quick. Uh, I, you know, my wife would come home, and here's the thing. It's only been like eight hours. My shift was about eight hours, and I'd be like, it's yours. I'm done. My shift is over, right? So she still has her bags and everything on her. She's like, wait. I'm like, I'm out. So one day, the delivery guy, he looked at me really weird. I wonder why he did that. She said, well, were you wearing that pink headband when you answered the door? Yes. So watch a two-year-old. Now, here's the thing. To those of you who are not parents, like it's worse than that. That's like the easy stuff, right? So who are not parents, you're going to be like, oh, I've done that. Or, blah, blah, blah. I want you to meditate on something. You had the option of giving it back. That's the thing. Yeah, you could give it back. There was like a light at the end of your tunnel, right? So the darkness. Anyway, <laughs> here's one. This is really funny. And now all you guys are going to get mad. So, all right, here, here's what I want you to do. If you think you're good at a sport or anything, do that sport or anything with a real professional. Try it with a real professional. Right, so we got a lot of big uh, fish, small pond guys, right? So the, I like to golf with my buddies, you know, because it makes you feel good. So that's what happens with me, right? You want to feel awesome about yourself? Invite me to play golf with you. It doesn't matter. Even if you never played before, you will be better than me. I, like a five-year-old who's good at t-ball will beat me. Like that's just the thing. I'm terrible. So anyway, though, I kind of laugh. I see a lot of guys like they think they're great and they tout their golf skill. I'm just using golf because I'm hedging my bets. There's like 90,000 golf courses, so I figure more people have probably done that here. Anyway, it can be anything you do. Right? And they feel awesome. So, but then, uh, you know, you play with the golf instructor. And he, like, totally destroys you. Right? It's like that in anything. They'll just totally destroy you. Now, there's two levels of humility here. We're going to get to a different place. So you know I'm not bragging. We used to see this in martial arts all the time. And so I'm going to relate it to that. So you get to a point, and it took me 10 years to get my black belt. It's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts kind of thing. They invented it. So it's very humiliating because you're always tapping out. You do that a lot more often than you tap anybody else out in the beginning. So it takes a very long time because you have to be able to tap out the black belts in order to get the black belts, not hit the board stuff. No, it's real. And so it's very, very difficult. And you get to a point, once you get up to, like, black belt, where you, know, you line up your class and you just have some fun. You just tap them all out. <laughs> and that's great. So that's why I had to quit. Pride, right? So I can't do that anymore. So, but it feels great. So anyway, <laughs> tap out the whole room, the whole classroom. Everybody's tapping out. 
And that's kind of cool, right? So that's what it's like. So if you're a tough guy, the gym that I started here when we moved down here, those guys are still running it. It's a different gym, but they're really good. And so if you think you can fight, I'll send you there. It'll be funny. Uh, please tape it. So <laughs> we'll show it on Sunday. So, you know, let the professionals do it. But here's the other tier. If your golf instructor's being honest with you, <laughs> he will tell you that he's good until Tiger Woods shows up. Then there is a chasm between him and Tiger Woods, right? So the same difference between, and I, my students wouldn't believe me until I saw it. I'd be like, look, the difference between you, White Belt, and me, there's that same <laughs> distance between me and my teacher, the world champion. I'm teaching because I have to. <laughs> that's the thing, right? So that's what would happen. Every few months, my teacher would come in and make me look like a white belt. Double level of humility, right? So now the white belt's going, what? Yes, you have that long to go. So humbling experience. Do a sport with a real professional. Try that out. All right, here's another one. Clean up somebody else's mess. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I think it is. You do that a lot. Anyway, <laughs> clean up somebody else's mess. Have a Christian attitude. Ah, turn somebody else's responsibility into your opportunity. Ah, that Galatians thing there, right? Next time someone annoys you, don't tell anybody else. So if you're in the cafe, right, and someone gets up from the table and they're like, we're out, and then they leave their mess, just clean it up. We're going to tie two together. Clean it up, and then don't say anything. Don't be like, did you see how so-and-so left the mess? And then I cleaned the table. Jesus says you just crossed it out. You negated it, right? So it's a waste of your time. So <laughs> clean it and shut up. Like, that's it. Just do that. Humility. The other thing, too, when you go talking about other people, it's called gossip. That's what that's called. That's a sin, too. So here we go. I told you it's going to be fun today. <laughs> All right. So here's a good one. This is, this is really good. The next time something isn't done your way, leave it. Next time something isn't done your way, just leave it. Understand that there may be a reason it's that way. It's kind of funny. When you go to pastor school, you learn something. It's pretty interesting. When you enter a new church, like if you took a job, a job at a new church, you are not, and this is true, you're not supposed to change anything for six months to a year. You're supposed to leave it alone. Why? Well, maybe the pastor before you knew that church a little bit better than you did on day one. Right? So you, you change the culture slowly if you want to. But you do a lot of listening and watching. There might be a way it's like that. I don't know. But try that out. Here's a good one. Spend a whole day not correcting anyone. Not going to look at anybody. No. <laughs> Spend a whole day not correcting anyone. Ouch. Can you do it? Especially if it's none of your business. Especially if it's none of your business. See, humility is not giving an answer where there was no question. Nobody asked. The only thing you should assume is there is something you might not know. The only thing you should assume, there is something you might not know. And here's the thing. <laughs> if you were asked a question... Only answer the question you were asked. <laughs> Just answer the question you were asked. We need to stop trying to let everyone know we know everything. What you think you know. All right, here's another one. Don't qualify yourself. Don't qualify. So if you're younger or whatever, you might not. Like, don't try to tell everybody how good you are at certain things. Just do it. Just do it. Don't qualify yourself. It seems that like everybody's running around handing out a resume that nobody asked for. Right? I'm not hiring. You know, why are you telling me that? Right? So tell me how good I am at everything. Just do it. Just do it. Let your work show your worth, right? Not your words. And no, theology, stop. We're saved by grace, not by works. Don't go there. Try saying we're going to do this one together. 
I could be wrong. Let's try it. Right? You can do it. Come on out. Right? Come out of the boat, Peter. You can do it. Ready? I could be wrong. So true. Right? So <laughs> remain teachable. This is huge. Remain teachable. Remain teachable. So many people are not teachable. I am to the point, I've hired all different kinds of people. So I worked in retail for a long time. I was a, like an operations manager, a district manager. I was in charge of a lot of different people. Martial arts schools, lots of different instructors. That was easier, though, because you just tap them out. I told you about that. So <laughs> you can't do that anywhere else, really. But in church, can't do that here. Kind of difficult, right? But So anyway, here's the thing. I am to the point where I would rather hire someone or take someone with absolutely no experience in this job who just has a good attitude. Someone teachable. That's it. I am, I, and this is not an exaggeration or a joke. I was actually talking to one of the leaders here, one of the board members, about that. I'm just praying, Lord, send me my Timothy. Right? And he, it's better if he never worked in a church before because then he's got no bad habits. I saw this on a sitcom. It was really funny. My character, and if you know, I'm not going to say the name of the show, but he obviously hired this girl because she was good looking, right? And they're like, she's not qualified. She's not qualified. But his reason is she's got no bad habits. Yeah. No bad habits. That's what I'm praying for. Like, doesn't even need to just read your Bible, follow me around. You'll get it. Like, two, we'll do like three to five years and you'll get it. That's all you need to do. Remain teachable. I don't need the, yeah, but I beg to differ. Just, please go do that, right? Yeah, but shouldn't we? No, teachable. <laughs> we talked about relationships last week, right? So there are a couple of keys here in this whole thing, right? Spending time together was one of them. That's what we went over. And listening. Another one, and it's a component in humility, is trust. Trust is another one, right? Trust. If you don't trust your employer... Get another job. Just get another job. But don't tell him what to do or how you're going to change everything. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. People go for interviews and be like, you know, I'm going to make your company better. They're not listening to anything else you say after that. They're just waiting until the interview is over. We'll call you. That's a lesson if you haven't learned it yet. Do not. If you don't trust your employer, find another one. If you don't trust your pastor, find another church. Just enough. Trust. So here's the thing. Relationship. This is funny. You ever do the exercise where, like, one person's behind the other one and the other one's just going to, like, fall? And trust that you're caught. You probably did that, right? So I had a better version of that. If my wife was behind me, her arms were around my neck and she was choking me. <laughs> that's right. That's it. Right there. That's what it looks like. Right? So when you're on, like, a, a photo set and your wife decides, what? Were you my wife at that? No. Wow, that's over 20 years old, that picture. 20 years ago. Yeah, over 20 years ago. So that's the thing. So you got to have trust, right, in a relationship. Here's the funny thing. If you know anything about jujitsu, it's kind of funny. <laughs> trust leads to surrender. You have to surrender some of yourself to trust somebody, don't you? Trust and surrender are the components of humility. And it's interesting, in jiu-jitsu, it's a really interesting thing. It's something I probably overlook, right, because it begins there. You're going to work out with somebody. Well, you're going to trust that your partner is going to stop when you tap, right? I keep no, so Hollywood's totally wrong because you don't die. If someone holds it and then you, like, fall asleep, it's actually really funny and entertaining. It's great. So the, we did it all the time. Like, sometimes I'd be like, oh, I didn't feel you tap, and you let them go. What they do is they fall asleep. They're like, and, and you got to roll them on their side so they don't throw up in their mouth. So just a disgusting thing. But, you know, they kind of do that. You roll them on the side. And it's like, yeah, you know, 10 to 30 seconds later, they go. <laughs> and they don't know where they are or they're still fighting. <laughs> it's like, ha, ha, you got put to sleep by a girl. And so it's just a fun thing. To, again, it's why I don't do jiu-jitsu anymore. So anyway, yeah, we loved doing that. So, yeah, you just put people to sleep. So you got to trust the person is not going to put you to sleep or, you know, break your arm. Right? They got you in an arm bar. <laughs> you know, so you got to trust. And you have to surrender. I give up. That's difficult. 
It's the lesson in humility. So it was like worse than church. If 10 people tried class, like a half a person came back. You had to get like two weeks in to get one person to join, right? So <laughs> it's tough. But it requires humility. You learn it quick in that because otherwise you get hurt. Maybe I'll start a jujitsu class. That would be kind of fun. Be nice for me. But this type of humility in a relationship leads to a good one. So whether it be your training partner, right, you need to trust one another. It requires surrendering to one another. Right? It requires humility. But here's the thing, real quick. You might think like, oh, yeah, so the black belts are humble. No. As soon as you get to the point where you can tap everybody out, you run with it. You just tap, tap everybody out. No humility goes right out the window. So it didn't work in that industry. That's why we're not going to try it here. So <laughs> anyway, surrender. It's hard. It's hard. Because, as I said earlier, it is contrary to what the world teaches us. We're taught to win. You ever hear the phrase, get ahead? I'm just trying to get ahead. Get ahead of what? Who? I'm trying to get ahead of who? Of what? Pray tell. You're supposed to win. So someone has to lose. The Bible sounds crazy. <laughs> We're told to win, whether it be literal fights or arguments. You got to win that argument. Let me tell you something, and I've said it before. I have never won an argument, because I'm not a lawyer. But you get my point. I've never won an argument. The person came into the argument with their own set of ideas that were not going to change, that only the Holy Spirit was going to change, but I played God. Ba -ba 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 and made an enemy. That's it. It's the only thing I accomplished. I made it worse, not better. I've never won an argument. But this is all foolish to the world, which is why Paul says the cross is foolish. 1 Corinthians 1. It's foolish to the world. This idea. And we have early graffiti. It's interesting. Some of the earliest like graffiti we have, Christian graffiti, Roman soldier must have converted because his friends are making fun of him. And the name is really hard to say, so I'll say Alexander's God is what the graffiti it says on the graffiti. And it's Jesus, human body, with a donkey head. What kind of God is that? He's a donkey. He's crazy. Well, God dies. That's stupid. It's always been contrary to the world. Nothing new. But here's the thing. The gospel hasn't changed. You getting that? The gospel has not changed. It's the same. The story is still the same. So people will still make fun of you if you really preach the gospel. That sounds stupid. And even some Christians don't get this. <laughs> it drives me nuts. I see this t-shirt sometimes, and I'm like, just don't say anything. Jesus didn't tap. You ever see that? Jesus didn't tap. Maybe it's just me. I saw it, right? I have an eye for these things. I'm like, wrong! <laughs> That's wrong. They've got the whole story wrong. You don't know anything. Christian, where is that? You know nothing about the gospel. That's wrong. Jesus Surrendered. He surrendered. Not my will, but yours, Father. All right? What does Peter do to Malchus? Did you know that was him? Cuts his ear off. No, stop. Puts the ear back on. Perfect timing. <laughs> Can you do that every time I make a hand gesture and a, a big statement? That would be awesome. So, <laughs> we can arrange that. We must surrender. That was the key, like Jesus did. And scriptures say this all over the place. He's not the only one. He says, in fact, it's what you have to do to be a follower of him. Did you know that? In order to follow Jesus, he has two prerequisites. The first one is deny yourself. Deny yourself. Second, pick up your cross. This is going to hurt. This is not normal. It's not the way the world thinks, and you may just get killed for it. It's all over the place. 
Read your Bible. Then you can be a true follower when you accept that. So the Bible tells us to think like Jesus. And I'm going to do a little something, and I'm going to close on this. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes people will make the mistake because they haven't been here for a while. And they'll ask me, like, uh, what's your favorite verse of Scripture? Now, those of you who have been here for a while are like, don't, don't ask that question because I'll show you the verse of the day problem, right? <laughs> you know, the way we read a book. Would you pick up a book? I give this illustration all the time. I'm trying to change it. Would you pick up a book and then randomly read one sentence at a time over the course of five years? Do you think you'd know that story well? Not at all. But that's exactly how Christians read the Bible. Randomly picking one sentence. <laughs> yeah, I know the word well. No, you don't. You can't get the context like that. So, I have favorite books of the Bible. I sit down, I just read the whole thing. And it's worth like 20 minutes of my life. Imagine that, right? So, Philippians is one of my favorites, especially in one section here. Uh, scholars will call it the Carmen Christi because it's probably an early hymn or poem about Jesus. And it tells us about who he is and what he did. So, I want to kind of go over that. And I want you to look for the words that we talked about today and realize that they're being applied to Jesus. Philippians 2, 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Greek, think like Jesus. Make your thinking like his. Attitude is good. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. So here, this is just, you got to go deep to get it. Your version might say robbed, grasped. It's not grasped like think of. He's reversing the sin of Adam. It's beautiful if you read this in the Greek, because you'll get it. Our pogman snatched. What did Adam do? Fruit, tree, stole it, right? He's trying to steal. That was the, the, the basis of it. Steal equality with God. Robbed it. Jesus reverses it. Amazing. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Literally, humbled himself in obedience to death, even to death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and below the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus gives us the ultimate example in humility, and we are to follow. We're not God, but Jesus is. Jesus obeyed his parents. <laughs> Jesus was humble. Jesus washed feet. Jesus died a humiliating death on a cross. So, how much more should we be doing in the shadow of that cross? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came today. Let them be encouraged by your word, by your scriptures, the truths in them. Let them penetrate not just the minds, but the hearts, ultimately bringing people into your kingdom, ultimately making us reflect, causing us to think that we should be like Jesus, just vessels of your love, your grace, your mercy, your peace, your kindness, your gentleness to the world around us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.